Hi, welcome to the Shepherd's Rest Doc Talk. This is episode 45B. I'm Cam and this is Jilly. Yes, this is the Brit Hadashar, the New Testament discussion of this week's Torah portion. And we have two places this week. Uh, the first is Luke 13, all of Luke 13. Mm -hmm. And the second is John 10, 22 through 42. So I'm going to do my best to 10 to 40. That's a lot. Yeah, I'm going to do my best to hit highlights. Yes. To only hit highlights. Yeah. All right, so let's just jump in in 13.1. Okay. And it says, And some were present at that time, reporting to him, meaning Yeshua, reporting to Yeshua, about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their offerings. So basically, Pilate, bad dude. He was not a good guy. There were some horrible stories of things being mm -hmm. atrocities that he has committed, and this was one of them. One of them was that he had a lot of Galileans killed on the temple mount, in the temple area where they would do their offerings, where the Jews would do their offerings. So, and so basically you have Yeshua answering them saying, and Yeshua answered and said to them, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all other Galileans because they had suffered like this? I say to you, no, but unless you repent, you shall all perish in the same way. Or those 18 of whom the tower of Siloam fell and killed them. Do you think that they were greater offenders than all other men who dwelt in Jerusalem? I say to you, but unless you repent, you shall all perish in the same way. Now, Yeshua saw these as harbingers. So I love that because we're not to look at individuals and say, oh, I bet, I bet that bad thing's right. happening because they're sinners. That's not, you know, if you happen to notice a sin, that would just be to help them out. But we're right. not to sit in judgment like other. Oh, however, we can look at these incidences as harbingers because Yeshua, here is Yeshua. And what is a harbinger? A harbinger is kind of like um, a warning, basically. Okay. It's something that happens to show, look, if you don't get it together, it's going to happen again on a bigger scale. And that's exactly what happened 40 years after they rejected Yeshua right. is Rome came in and slaughtered millions mm -hmm. of Jews. So, however, had they repented right. and recognized him as the Messiah, the Messianic era would have started and they would have never died. Right. You know, they would have lived through eternity. I mean, that's, right. that was the whole point. That's what they were looking for. But he just goes right into the parable about the gardener um, who has a vineyard and has a fig tree and the fig tree he comes for three years so when you were talking in your yeah. portion about that he provides for, for three, three years, years uh -huh. and I thought oh that's funny because I have a three years so for three <laughs> years he comes and he's looking for the fruit and there's no fruit he said you know what? just cut it down yeah and the one tending the garden's like wait 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 let me dig around it throw manure on it and see if it produces fruit. I thought, oh my gosh, isn't that exactly what tends to happen to us when yeah. we're just stagnant? We have it to go to through. Stink. We well, we start have to go. <laughs> we have to have crap thrown at us. That's right. That's right. That's <laughs> we right. We have to go through some really hard times to get us going again. All right. You know, to produce the that fruit shell. that is unto righteousness. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting because for a tree, the first three years, no man is to eat of. It's only... Right, and Lord. I have that in here. That's Leviticus 19, yeah. uh, 23 through 25. When you plant a tree in the land of Israel, mm -hmm. and it for three years, the fruit, there's going to be fruit, but you right. don't eat of it. Right. And then the fourth year, all of the fruit is to the Lord. Right. Yeah. And then you can eat of it in the fifth year, which I think yeah. that's interesting that they say, you know, come back, let's do one more year. Right. Which would go into the fourth year. Right, that would be all to the Lord. Right. So we see starting in Luke 13, 10, that Yeshua is teaching in one of the synagogues in the Galilean area. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure the place is packed. I mean, I'm this sure. is the end of his ministry. Anytime Yeshua comes to town, oh, be our guest speaker. Yeah. You know, because he guest. brings the guest. crowds. That's right. Yes, he does. And, um... We are th about three months from uh, the Passover, from his death, burial, and resurrection, from the big event is yeah. what I like to call it. I like to call it the big event. Yeah. <laughs> We're three months away, so his popularity is growing, you know. Word is spread. It, it, well, it's grow We're going to see that um, in a few minutes. It is growing to the point where now not only do the uh, Sadducees want him put to death by stoning for blasphemy, but you also have 
King Antipas, who was like, this is getting out of hand. Yeah. I've got to take control of this. He could start a revolution, a revolt. You know, he did, yeah. but it was a spiritual revolution. Right. That's what I love about yes. it. That's All right. So as he's speaking, he sees a woman who's hunchbacked, who's bent over. And I love Ooh, it because we just year. talked yeah, about week. this last week. Uh -huh. so, um, so for 18 years, she was hunchbacked over. And in Leviticus 21, 20, we, it talks about certain people that cannot enter into the temple. And one of the priests who can't work in the temple are ones that are hunchback. And it's because the um, temple is to represent eternity. It's to represent the heavenly, eternal temple. And there's not going to be any deformities right in the temple so we have to keep it as a replica a true replica a shadow a, a shadow a true shadow of what's to come so when someone is hunchbacked it means that they are weakened and they can't easily be yoked which i thought huh, this is the northern kingdom you, they can't be yoked together Ooh, yeshua yeah. this is kind of a um what he's going to accomplish, mm -hmm. you know, with his big event. Yeah. Um, this is a harbinger in a good way. <laughs> I don't know. You know, the this forerunner. This is one being listened to. Right. And it's on the Sabbath. And I love his argument here because this really made me stop and go, oh, wait, okay. The argument he used is an oral law, right. not a Torah law. So basically he's saying, look, the Lord has given you the authority to make, to bind and loose. Mm -hmm. I just loosed this woman. You already have a law that says you can untie and loosen your animal and take them to let them have a drink of water. Mm -hmm. How much more so a daughter of Abraham who is in need of being loosed from a bondage. Yeah. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because basically he's saying, look, the Torah gives you the leeway to make that judgment. Right. And if like you'll do it for an animal, why won't you do it for a right. woman? You're right. just mad at me because I did it on the Sabbath day, but you're completely ignoring. In other words, they're being legalistic because they're missing the miracle. Right. Because it's the letter that they're looking at. Right. Or what they think they're looking at when he's even proving to them, no, even according to your oral law. Right. It's permissible to loose to relieve human suffering on right. the Sabbath. And again, I would say this points to a bigger picture of what he's going to do on the ultimate Lord's Day, the That's ultimate right. Sabbath of loosening us from all of those deformities, right. all of those bondages, all of the spiritual junk that we have will be completely removed from us. And That's we will right. be able to worship him the way we're supposed to yes, worship him. The way him. he wants us That's to. That's right. And then he says in 24, strive to enter through the narrow gate because many, I say to you, shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. Here he's saying, look, I'm telling you, enter through that narrow gate because at the end, everybody's going to be trying. I thought of like a bottlenecking, yeah, you know, when yeah, you get funnel, in, in yeah. the right and you're in the right lane. Yes, it's, it's slower, but you know it's going to come to the point where these people can't even enter right. in. You know, they've been on this wide road and they can't get to that narrow. They're all taking the exits and they're they're five miles back. Right. The road <laughs> goes like this, but then you realize that the door's only this big. Yeah. You know, and the wide gate is like this, but it just falls off. I mean, there's nothing yeah. on the other side. There's only one way yeah. to get in and they're going to be yeah. trying to get in and they're not going to be able to. He goes on to say, it's like the man who... When all his guests get there, he gets up and he closes the door and the people are knocking going, Master, Master, which shows they know who he is. Right. But he, he says, is. I don't know who you are because you've been working unrighteousness. Hey, you don't look like me. Right. And you it don't goes, look like my family. Right. And it goes right back to um, what he said in Matthew about, you know, many will say to me in that day, Lord, yeah. Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we do all these marvelous works, prophesy in your name, do everything in your name? He used to say, I never knew you. And we see the ending of Luke 13 is basically his disciples, some disciples coming to him and saying, you got to get out of here. Herod Antipas wants to kill you. Yeah. And he says, will you tell that fox? That's <laughs> and right. fox was like the lowest, you know, every dog has its day. But yeah. the point is, at the end of the day, you're still a dog. Yeah. You know, according to Solomon, right, mm -hmm. in Proverbs, Foxes, Solomon. the Song of Solomon, foxes are known to be false prophets. So by saying that King Herod Antipas is a fox, 
it also is saying he's a false prophet because then Yeshua goes on and gives a prophecy. Yeah. And he says, see, I cast out demons and perform healings today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. And I, you know what I thought of here is the Akidah. Is, oh, yeah. You know, that's what I thought of. Um, the Akidah, if you don't know, it's the binding of Isaac. Yeah. Basically, you know, Abraham was on a three-day journey, mm -hmm. and then you have the binding of Isaac. Well, in Jewish... Um, tradition and well I mean in Judaism that is a humongous event yes it is and we know it because that's a big event for us because Yeshua fits that pattern right of you know he was the replacement lamb he right. was when um, Abraham told Isaac God will provide himself the lamb yeah Yeshua was that lamb right. and here it's almost like he's saying this and they would automatically go oh the Akida yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, because he goes on to say, but I have to journey today, tomorrow, and the following, because it is not fitting for a prophet to perish outside of Jerusalem. So that. he's calling himself the good right. prophet, the prophet right. here. Herod Antipas, the false prophet, he's the good prophet. Yeah. And even though it looks like Herod Antipas is the one that has it all together, together yeah. and the success, you know, it's the truth. Yeshua has the truth on his right. side. Yeah. And in the end, that is what's going to matter. Right. And he yeah. will be given everything. But he goes yeah, on. Yeah, oh my gosh, that's right. So he will be what what Herod is trying, trying to, to achieve. achieve. Yeshua yes. already has it. Yes, because Herod Antipas wants the title King of the Jews. Yes, he does. And Caesar will not give it to him. All right, so then you see him saying, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, killing the prophets and stoning those who are sent to her. How often I wish to gather your children together the way a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings but you would not see your house is left to you laid waste so this is a prophecy right. and truly I say to you you shall by no means see me again until the time comes when you say blessed is he who is coming in the name of the Lord now we know this happens right. when he comes in on the donkey mm -hmm. you have people singing this to him however when he says it as in a collective all of Jerusalem yeah it's that authority those of the authority those the of people authority, in charge which we just see those of authority Basically saying he's nothing. Yes. Now he's turning around going, not until those people. Right. Right. Gone. All right. So we know since Jerusalem's going to be laid waste, that happens mm -hmm. in 40 years from the time he gives this prophecy about. And um, he says, but you won't see me again until you say, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, this is a song that they sing every Passover when they would come up to the Temple Mount and bring the... Um, bring the lambs. Right. So I thought to myself, wouldn't it be really interesting that if the tabernacle or the temple or whatever is going to be set up, um, the third one, uh -huh. before he comes back, it's set up for the purpose. So they will sing this because here's what they're going to hear. In 22, it'll say, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. Mm -hmm. And then it goes on and on. And then it says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the in the name of the Lord, and I thought, wouldn't that be interesting? Because they're gonna, when they start doing this again and start singing it, they're gonna be like, oh, the stone that we rejected, <laughs> yeah, and may it, that may trigger like a, oh my gosh, it really was, right? Maybe right. we really did miss the first coming, yeah, of the Messiah, because you already have rabbis in Israel saying no one kept the Torah better than yeah, Yeshua. Than Yeshua. No exactly. one taught the Torah more correctly than Yeshua. Okay, moving to John. We'll just okay. touch on a couple of things there. Um, John 10, 22 says, At that time, the dedication, or Hanukkah, mm -hmm. came to be in Jerusalem, and it was winter. So, here we see Yeshua is at the temple. Mm -hmm. goes on to say, um, And Yeshua was walking in the set-apart place in the porch of Solomon. So, King Herod had built up basically his own little thing going on here. But the porch of Solomon on the eastern side was the only thing left from King Solomon's um, temple, okay. basically. Cause yeah, he had, it had been upgraded. Right. Uh, King Herod had expanded yeah. every way, but you couldn't on the east because right. of the Kidron Valley. Right. And there was thought to be a bridge that reached from the porch of Solomon mm -hmm. all the way over to the Mount of Olives. But they haven't found, they haven't excavated that yet. But a lot of the literature shows and talks about it. Yeah. Okay, so basically the one thing I want to say here is Yeshua acknowledged Hanukkah. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's right. So, and um, 
And participated in And it. participated and us being, you know, grafted in. Right. It's a really neat connection to make here to say, you know, Hanukkah's not just... A lot of people think that Hanukkah is a Jewish version of Christ Christmas. Right. But it's not. It was way before. Yeah. And it's something that the master, our, that Yeshua acknowledged right. and even, like Cam said, participated in. Right. So I just wanted to throw that out there, first of all. Okay. And they go on and say, listen, if you're really the Messiah, then just tell us plainly. They didn't want to really know if he was Messiah. No they just wanted, they, they just really want, yeah. just wanted to stone him. Yeah. Don't so, make me know the word. <laughs> just say it. Just, right. Exactly. Just don't, We don't me. want something that has to testify to who you are. Right. <laughs> just tell us so we can stone you. So right. we have a legitimate reason exactly. for stoning you. And he says <laughs> something very interesting. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I learned something this week. I love that. I knew this, but I didn't really know this. I learned that that's an idiom that Jews would say that meant they obey me. They obey well, my commands. Well, hear yeah. means to hear, hear and obey. Right, but it's not the... Julie, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, I think I heard the Lord talking. Yeah. Yes, that's definitely the Lord. No, it's when you hear something and you know Scripture, it's, hidden, it's written on your heart. Torah is written on your heart. You can say, yes, that lines up with scripture. I can, I can. Well, think about that just Handle with that. your kids. Uh -huh. If you're like, uh, if I'm like, hey, um, honey, to a kid. Or, hey, Drew, go take out the trash. Okay. Uh, go take out the trash. I know he heard me because he said, okay. Right. But not until he takes the trash out has he heard me. Oh, yeah. I, I use that analogy I know. all the time. That's but, right. Like about teachers. You yeah. know, you walk into a classroom and everybody's being unruly and they're like, okay, everybody line up. And they just look at the teacher and they go back to their, and she said, they won't even listen. Yeah, they heard you. Right. They just don't want to do it. Right. We all hear the word, but it, he says over and over, it doesn't matter. They obey the word. Right. They hear my voice and, and obey. obey. And I want to skip all the way to the end where it says, Therefore, they were seeking again to seize him. This is the, okay, so in Luke, at, this happened right before, Herod Antipas wanted to seize him. Okay. Now we have, now the Sadducees who <laughs> want to seize him. So you have, I love this, you have the spiritual leaders and the, oh, the, yeah, the physical, the physical yeah. like the um, law, you know, right. according to the law right. leaders, both seeking to destroy him. Yeah. And where does he, he escapes to Perea, which is on the other side of the Jordan, where he stays the entire winter. I thought, oh my goodness, this has to be prophetic. This ha I don't know how it fits yet. I'm still working on that. Yeah. But I'm telling you, this has to be prophetic for us. Because in, in um, Luke, well in Luke, but I'm talking about the one in oh, Matthew, Matthew 24. 24. Matthew 24, he says, when you see the abomination that causes desolation... Right. Run for the hills. Which was Hanukkah time. Which was Han happened at Hanukkah. This really could be a key for those who have ears to ears or ears to hear. Yeah. Um, to know and understand that, you know, there's uh, quite a few people that believe that there's not going to be a rapture out of here. There's going to be one, an exodus of protection. Yeah. Revelation 12 talks about the woman um, that is protected in the wilderness right. for three and a half years. And I thought... Who knows? Could it be at this time? Could this be a clue of where we're going to go and how it's going to be? You really are going to have the religious system and the governmental system stacked against right, us. Right, mm -hmm. Yeshua did. That's we're right. not going to be any different. That's right. I mean, he came to show us how to follow him in every aspect. So I just thought, I don't know, that's kind of interesting. It could be a clue as to... Uh, where that woman will be taken out into the wilderness. Yeah. And the woman is the one who has the testimony of Yeshua and yeah. the commandments of the, of the Lord. Yeah. Yeah. So that's it. That's all I have for you today. It was really good. Yeah, it was a, a good one. Like it was it. a lot, a lot this week. Yeah, I like it. All right. Well, thank you for joining us, and we will see you again next week for episode 46. Woo! We're getting up there. There yeah, we are. <laughs> All right. Well, we hope you have a fantastic week, and we'll see you next time. Shalom. Shalom.